But in the past 35 years, they have become a world leader in dental materials and dental products. Ben Supply has been a good friend to the local dentists and to the New York community. Chris Clark joined Ben Supply in September of 1992. He's held the positions of Director of Marketing, General Manager, Vice President, Executive Vice President, and most recently Chief Operating Officer for the past six years. In April of this year, he was named President and Chief Financial Officer. I had the pleasure of meeting Chris two years ago and becoming friends with he and his family through his daughter Allison, who was involved uh, well, in the exchange program. Chris will be giving us a brief update on Best Plan International and the father's perspective of the of the uh, youth exchange program. It's a pleasure to introduce the President of Best Plan. Uh, 
Uh, the good news in the developed markets, which is about 20% uh, of the needs and about 80% of the business, uh, if you will, in terms of the global market. The good news is we're getting older. I mean, that sounds like good news, but from, from a dental perspective, that's great news. Because as we get older, we're tending to keep our natural teeth longer, and we're tending, we're tending to spend more on our dental, on our, uh, dental care as we age. In the emerging markets, which is about 80% of the teeth, but only about 20% of the market worldwide, my major driver there is the, the exploding middle class in these communities regions, particularly in regions like China and in Russia and in Latin America. And uh, this is an area that uh, we have, uh, that's why I spent uh, heavily over the last uh, 10 or 15 years in terms of building infrastructure to uh, be able to take advantage of that uh, opportunity as a uh, result. As and uh, that delivers a disproportionate amount of growth basically for the company uh, year on year. Uh, a little bit on the, um, the footprint, uh, again, it's a little bit tough to read in the back, but I'll kind of describe it. Uh, basically, uh, anywhere the dentistry is done worldwide, uh, you'll see our products there. Uh, in short, uh, again, about a third, about a third of the business overall is in the United States. Uh, just under half our business is in Europe. So we're, uh, we're pretty dependent on the European economies at the stage of the game, but uh, again, overall, it's, uh, it's uh, still been uh, quite good despite, uh, despite the uh, European uh, and the emerging markets together comprise uh, about 50% of our business, with a smattering in Japan, about 4% of Canada, and about the same in Australia. So again, virtually anywhere the dentistry is being done, we will find us. Now, I, I mentioned that Europe is important to us. Uh, we have about 900 associates based here. Uh, and again, it is our world, world headquarters. Uh, so most of our senior executives, all of our senior executives, uh, with the exception of a few that uh, are based in Europe in terms of operating the base based there, are all based here. Uh, it's about 7.5% of our global workforce. In addition to corporate headquarters over on Philadelphia Street, the Susquehanna Conference Center, we also have the uh, prosthetics business, which is uh, based over on College Avenue. It's still operating on the two factory that we bought in 1906, and still making the engine teeth today. Uh, they make quite a few other products as well, which we'll talk about in a little bit. We have the professional division, which is up on Smile Way, right, uh, right uh, this north of the in Lozo. And uh, yeah, again, that's basically running our U.S. preventive business, which uh, is focused on dental hygiene. And also, in that business as well, as our pharmaceutical business that focuses on uh, dental, dental anesthetic, as well as uh, we make bone reactive materials there as well. So again, York is, uh, York is very important to us, uh, with about 900 associates. I have mean, 900 associates based here. Our product line mix, uh, about half of our business is focused on dental specialties. Uh, these would be the products that are sold not to necessarily a general dentist, but to a specialist focusing on your implants, and the dots, or root canals, or the dots. Uh, those are typically sold on a direct basis, as opposed to some of your distribution. Our share site is a business, which is really the business that uh, if you go to the dentist, that's the bread and butter dentistry that uh, is being done day in, day out, and you would probably know most, most uh, frequently as the patient. Uh, that comprises about 30% of our business, with uh, there being half basically split between the percentage business Again, which is the entry and Crown Bridge, and then also the medical business that I described for this. I'll do a quick, uh, quick dive on a few of these areas. In the, uh, in the church site consumables business, we typically are number one or number two uh, in both the uh, restorative businesses, which is basically uh, replacing cabinets, if you want, filling cabinets, and also preventive businesses, which is hygiene and, uh, and, uh, and scaling. Uh, we're pretty much one or two in virtually every category we have. As I mentioned, uh, these businesses are uh, they're basically done by virtually every dentist worldwide, and that gives us a pretty significant reach uh, in terms of our products basically uh, across the globe. So we're very pleased, uh, pleased with those businesses. Uh, the prosthetics business, which is uh, obviously very important to us based in York here, uh, we basically manufacture more dentistry here than we do anywhere else in the world. Uh, that's, that uh, basically comprises of both uh, the removal business, which is uh, basically dentistry, and also the fixed business, which is kind of great. This business in particular is a significant amount of uh, technology that continues to evolve in this, in this business, moving more and more towards uh, CAD cam related technologies, and obviously that's a growth opportunity for the company as well as we go. I mentioned a little bit about the specialties, I'll do a little bit of a deeper dive here on a couple. Uh, our endodontics business, uh, we are the third market leader, uh, and that is anything having to do with group panels uh, that uh, may not be very pleasant from a uh, patient perspective, but it's certainly pleasant from a uh, in the uh, orthodontics business, uh, business uh, we, were, uh, we were the number two bracket player in terms of traditional brackets worldwide uh, prior to the uh, Japanese natural disaster in uh, 2011. 
we had the unfortunate incident of situation that our long-term sole source supplier of brands we had a 45-year partnership with. The plant happened to be located all three kilometers from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Uh, so that was not a, not a particularly good day uh, for the two of them, but certainly uh, for our business as well. Our, our team uh, basically rallied overnight and uh, were able to identify some alternative sourcing to keep our customers afloat, if you will. And uh, we also worked with the partners, uh, and basically at this point, they're uh, fully back up. So that business, uh, we were number two, we're probably at this point number four, but uh, we're significantly rebuilding that business. And it's interesting, as I talk with employees, I've long used the, uh, the phrase saying, hey, the strength of the company really is the employees, that while well, we've got tremendous brands, we've got great, uh, great products, if you take away the products and take away the brands, we can rebuild it better than ever was before. And I never thought we had the opportunity to show it. But uh, now we do, and uh, fortunately everything uh, is certainly on track in terms of that recovery, so we're pleased with that. Our implant business, uh, we're the worldwide number three player in implants, with uh, number one and number two uh, right, uh, you know, right on the bumper. Uh, something to speak of there, of note, uh, we did a significant acquisition in just about two years ago, uh, close to August 30th, end of August 2011, where we bought AstraZeneca's uh, dental business in neurology. And uh, in short, that moved us to the number three player. It was a, uh, that added about 20% uh, to the company overnight in terms of size. And it was a $1.8 billion acquisition. Uh, we've been uh, focused on retiring debt pretty aggressively since then. And uh, again, we're very much uh, in the range we, uh, we think we need to be long term. So uh, that, that allows us, gives us some flexibility to move forward and really do some acquisitions. So uh, if we last business real quick was the medical business. And again, this is the urological. Catheters, and again, we're about another two or three player depending on the market. And these are basically uh, catheters that are used, uh, very frankly, for uh, patients. Many of them have uh, spinal cord injuries or uh, uh, multiple sclerosis. And again, these are uh, life changing, uh, life changing products. And again, we're uh, very pleased with the performance of that business in the United States. We uh, we've been blessed with a business that uh, has continued to uh, grow faster than the market. And I guess I would say that uh, you know, as we look at uh, and as I mentioned. Highs aren't that high in the and lows aren't that low. And uh, in short, before the recession, uh, the dental market was probably growing about 5%, and we were growing about a point and a half faster than that. And we've generally grown faster than the market uh, as we uh, move forward. But, uh, you know, I would say that the, the, uh, the recession has, uh, has had an impact on dental like it has anywhere else. Uh, we tend to grow again between the market tends to grow between one and two times the rate of the underlying economy. Uh, you can see the green bars there indicating you know, what we estimate that, uh, that growth to be. If we take, take that back to global GDP, it's probably pretty close. Again, we've been blessed to uh, have a business that, uh, and associates that uh, have done a nice job in terms of gaining market share faster than that. And again, that, uh, that certainly has helped our, our overall growth and our overall results. Uh, I want to do a quick, I want to do a deep financial overview, but just a couple of highlights. The company uh, reached uh, just under $3 million in sales last year. Operating profit uh, just under half a uh, half million. Uh, and uh, again, uh, as we look at it in terms of the impact year on year, with the impact of the uh, wraparound and the acquisition, the company grew about to 3 percent So again, a uh, pretty dynamic organization. But just to kind of describe that before I you know, move on to my second topic, I mean, the company's been around for 114 years. We started in 1899 as the dentist supply company in New York. Uh, three individuals, including uh, one individual from the York area, they sold dead teeth basically out of the Canberra building, which is in Times Square. Uh, the Canberra building is still there. We don't sell dead teeth anymore out of it. But uh, in short, uh, basically started in 1899. If you look at the, uh, you know, basically the growth history of the company, we moved to a half billion dollars in sales in 1993, uh, and pretty rapid growth and dynamic growth thereafter. So again, it's, uh, it's, I'm, we're blessed to be with a, a space that uh, is, is relatively dynamic, and certainly the company's been able to respond to that in relatively so uh, again, overall, we're, uh, we're very pleased with the industry and certainly the board we do that. I'd like to uh, transition now and talk a little bit uh, away from this point. I'll talk a little bit about what's growth the uh, growth rate of the human exchange program. I'll talk a little bit about the problem of the perspective. And you know, as David and as many of you may be aware, uh, the growth rate of the box of my RL and preserved the lock in 2011 2012. Uh, in addition, my wife Emily and I uh, were blessed to welcome uh, 
And uh, that, that experience really reinforced, I guess, simple thoughts that I had relative to the youth exchange program, and I'd like to share those with you. Um, first, what you're doing by investing in these young men and women uh, is simply exemplary. Um, the program is truly a life-changing experience for them. And the trust that you place in them, the opportunities you've given them are exceptional. And, you know, I, 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 before we go any further, I just personally have to thank you for it. It's made a tremendous difference in certainly my daughter's life, the same thing that he's had in Millie's life. And uh, again, these are experiences that they will carry with them for the rest of their lives. So again, as that means, we certainly thank you. Um, as that was his daughter, I, you know, I saw her self-confidence from. Um, you know, she, she was never particularly weak in the area of self-confidence, but it, it is one that he was, I still saw a significant difference both pre and post the event. And I did see her ability to adapt grow significantly as well. And those of you that know Allison know that she kind of likes things her way. And uh, her ability then to uh, adapt to things don't quite go her way. It might have been a little bit of an opportunity before, but she's uh, much more much more capable of rolling with punches, if you will. And I think a lot of that came because she had to learn, you know, basically how to communicate when she didn't know the language. She had to learn a new culture that was totally different from what she grew up in. Uh, she had to adapt to making new friends from scratch. And I also saw Millie's confidence grow so um, You know, she, when she first came with us, her social network was relatively small. And, uh, you know, she was really primarily interfacing with other exchange students and really kind of with her friends back home in Slovakia. And at the end, it was very clear that she had a very active social network here. And it caused her to branch out to new things, including taking up the cross, which is something that she had never been trained of and never even knew that the cross existed back in Slovakia. So again, just, just the, uh, the ability and the growth that you see from these, uh, from these young women, uh, uh, men and women is just is incredible. Um, I also saw Alice embrace a beautiful country uh, that uh, has wonderful people and tremendous natural beauty, but it doesn't have the economic resources that we have in the United States. Uh, she learned to adapt to live in a small apartment in a Soviet-style cinder block apartment complex, complete with the requisite graffiti on the outside. Uh, and learn that, you know, it isn't money that makes you happy. What makes you happy is the relationships, and those relationships are forever. Um, I also, she also came to appreciate the unique history and the background of other people from other cultures, including the Slovak culture in this case, that has a, as a people, they've been politically downtrodden for over 700 years. Various kinds by Hungarians, by Austrians, by Germans, and by, and by Russians. And yet, they still have a tremendous pride in the country. And as you talk to the Soviet, I'm sorry, the uh, Slovak uh, students, which I had the opportunity to visit her at the tail end of her trip, I had a year there and actually spent a day with her in her, in her classroom, meeting a fair number of the students, they just have tremendous uh, pride in the country and the opportunity that they've seen from it. Uh, so again, that, uh, that, that excitement, uh, again, just the interest in the history uh, is, is, is amazing. They did become really interested in history, both Millie and Allison. Uh, you know, Millie would ask, uh, constantly ask questions pertaining to American history or American historical events. And I found that Allison, who loved history before, really had even deepened perfect love of history even further until the rug now, obviously, far beyond, uh, far beyond uh, U.S. history, American history. And this is something that kind of came home to me during our visit there. And I, I want to share a personal story. And then while we were visiting Millie's family in a town called Boston, third largest city in Slovakia, about 150,000 people. Millie's father, Deshaun, who uh, you may be able to see there in the picture with me, he's a good one. Um, anyway, but uh, he, he took a student to a museum called, a museum called the Museum of the so a Slovak uh, National Uprising. And this museum commemorates the efforts of the Slovak people to overthrow the Nazi-supported public, public government that basically ruled them during World War II. And this uprising basically came together and uh, was struggle beginning in the winter of 1943, continuing on until the Soviets basically liberated the country in the spring of 1945. While we were in the museum, Mr. Sean was walking us through and, and sharing with us the stories and, uh, and uh, he led me over to the display case and he very quietly said, those are my father's artifacts. He was a leader of the one of the leaders of the others. And uh, he said, you know, he survived, most did uh, he survived. But he later spent two years in a, in a Soviet paper camp because the Soviets began to fear that the leadership of this uprising would, would in turn be a threat to their interests. Um, 
And during this period, the leaders of the uprising actually ended up living in the mountains. They hid in the mountains. And on one of the trips, he showed us, uh, when we hiked a fair amount when we were there, he showed us, you know, basically one of these little uh, bunkers. He said, it's bunkers like this, that were just kind of dug in the ground, that these, that these uh, leaders, and then these basically the, 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 the uprising folks, basically lived in for 16 months, including two women. Most of them starved or froze to death. They couldn't light, they couldn't light fires.
and uh, you all are 